inviting me back to speak to you. Normally when I, not normally, before when I've spoken here, I would speak about fieldwork. I'm going to drink someone else's drink. Um, speak about fieldwork I've been engaged in, but I haven't done much for the last two years. I've been in the office, so um, I had a bit of a trouble thinking about what I was going to talk about when Ellie emailed me, but then it coincided with something that happened that week at work. I apologise for the next slide, but you'll see why I'm showing it in a minute. Time Out magazine do a weekly feature, things you only know if you're a something or other. And, and my, obviously my bit was London archaeologist. Apart from the fact that I should have lied about my age. <laughs> the key bit, which people at the front can't see, but I said, um, then just like now, the place was a multinational melting pot of different nationalities. I should have meant, I should have said cultures, of course, but I was talking about early Roman London being full of people from all across the empire and how interesting that was and how we had archaeology to prove it. Um, didn't go down too well with UKIP. This is a tweet um, tweeted by the UKIP leader on the London Assembly who accused me of political agenda pushing. I don't work for the Museum of London either, sadly, because I would have been proud to say that. And then chap, Chesham and Amisham UKIP chap said, it's a total myth that the Romans were the first Londoners. A large settlement or cluster of settlements had long been established, probably for thousands of years, and with a large population. History reflects those that tell it. Well, of course, history does reflect those that tell it, absolutely, and what I'm going to say reflects me as, as a woolly liberal person hated by UKIP. Um, but, but when you refer to Roman London, the Roman city, which is Londinian, which we know is under the modern city, he's talking rubbish when he says that there was stuff underneath. So I thought I could use this to push my own agenda on you. Um, I hope you don't mind. And talk a bit about the early Roman Londoners, and we'll look at the archaeological evidence we have for them. And in order to do that, I thought I would talk about something that I do know about, which is the writing tablets from Bloomberg excavations, which I probably have told you about before. But here we're going to go into them a bit more in depth than I, I previously have done. And as a, a, ma a brief sort of background, these um, were preserved in the Warbrook stream, so there is some watery wood involved in my talk, luckily. Um, deep in the Warbrook Valley, when we excavated um, the Bloomberg building a few years ago, we found 400 pieces of stylus tablet, and they are reused barrel staves, so the sides of barrels which were used to import retsina into Londinium, and once the wine had been drunk, the barrels were dismantled and the side staves were reused um, to create these fantastic portable writing um, letter things, letters basically. There's wax embedded in them with beeswax from London with charcoal so that it shows up black and you use your iron stylus to write on the wax and of course if you're really lucky as an archaeologist the stylus goes through the wax, penetrates onto the wood and there you have your record forevermore on the wood. The wax doesn't survive. So here's just an example of what they look like. Most of ours are the upper type so you would fold them over, they have holes for leather um, thongs to tie them up so you would write your message your slave or whoever, take it to your recipient who would rub out your message and, and reply um, with their own message. And this is um, an example of a barrel. Um, I think this is from poultry over the road from Bloomberg. This is obviously reused as a sump or a, or a well or something. But this is exactly the kind of Roman barrel that you would expect to have been reused in the tablets. Now, there are lots of examples from Bloomberg and from elsewhere in London that are letters. Um, there are some that aren't letters. Unfortunately, not all of them have writing on, including this really enigmatic thing. Um, it's a label. It's got a hole um, to be tied around something. And I like to think that because it was found in the middle of the commercial centre of London, it was, it was engaged in, um, this is a, would have been a recording of, of whatever was in the sack or the barrel or the, the load of goods that this, this was a label for. But we did have some with addresses and names on, and those are the things that we're going to talk about particularly first, because when you have a name of somebody, you can trace where they might have come from. Um, to end up in Londinium, of course. And there were more than 100 names, 130 different names of Roman Londoners within our, our assemblage. Um, and these are, because we know there's no Iron Age precursor to Londinium, these are the people that came in in the first few decades. And all the tablets that we're talking about today date exclusively between 50 and 80 AD. So they're the first three decades of, of our city. First example I'm going to use, though, um, has a nice link to the north of England, for those of you who, who, who may be from further north and Watford. Um, this is a tablet that relates um, the industry that Tertius, the brewer, was engaged in. And although brachia, the, the word that's been translated as brewer, had some 
discussion as to whether it related to Maltster or Brewster. Basically, it relates to people that were involved in the production of beer. And Tertius was involved in the production of beer. And his name has also been found on, on barrels on Gresham Street and also in, engraved in same. He was quite a popular chap. He's a Mr. Weatherspoon of his day, basically. <laughs> and we know he's Mr. Weatherspoon of his day because he's also known in Carlisle, which is um, Luger Balio, which is the Roman name for Carlisle. So we know that Tertius was engaged in transporting a very valuable commodity from London all the way up to what was then the frontier of Roman Empire, Carlisle in about 70 AD was as far as the Romans had got. So he was probably supplying the army with um, the thing that they march on. There's another really nice address. This is actually um, an address. You probably would have seen this. It's on the front of the writing tablet book, but it's, it bears more discussion, really. Um, Mogontius in Londinium is how this translates. So Londinio is, is the word for London, and Mogontius is the chap's name, and he's living in London. And this is written from outside London. All the other addresses we'll look at are just um, very much more local. Um, if, if you have to specify that it's going to London, then it's coming from outside London. And it may have come from quite a, a long way away. Magontius is a, is a man's name, and it has um, links with the Celtic world. So it's not a Roman name. He's not a Roman citizen at this point. And we know that um, Magontiatum was um, the Roman name for Mainz, which is obviously in um, modern Germany, West Germany. So we know that there are people coming from that far away to London um, before 80 AD. We have another really nice specific address. This is the kind of thing I was talking about when I said that people in London who were writing to other people in London wouldn't have said in London. They would have said something like, opposite the house of Catullus. So Genius the Cooper, we know, lived opposite Catullus. And Genius the Cooper is quite an interesting character as well. We don't know anything more about him, but I like to think if he's a cooper, he's involved in barrels, barrel making, obviously. He may also have been engaged in barrel, bar, barrel dismantling, and therefore he may have been engaged in, the, in one stage of the production of these very tablets that his name appears on, which is really great. I've got notes because it's all Latin. <laughs> and I'm not a classicist and I never had any Latin at school, so you have to forgive me for looking at my notes. But one of the things that, um, another thing that the tablets tell us, not only where people are coming from, but also what they were doing when they were here. So we have, we have about 60 occupations named. Most of them are relating to the commercial sphere, buying, selling, dealing, lending, that kind of thing. A couple of them are much more specific. Um, we have the top right hand, it's not a great um, reproduction, I'm afraid, but it's in Latin, so it doesn't really matter, hopefully. Um, this is writing to Macrinus, um, and it's complaining that when Qataris had come and taken the beasts of burden away, investment which I cannot replace in three months. So this guy's beasts of burden, his oxen or his heavy cows, cattle that he was using to, to um, conduct his haulage business, basically, have been nicked while he was at the house of Diodemenus, um, Qataris has nicked them. Now, Qataris is an interesting name as well because it, has a, it also has a Celtic root um, which relates to battle. So he was obviously maybe an argumentative chap and that's how he ended up with such a, um, a name. Macrinus is also known from Carlisle as well in a similar context to um, our beer seller earlier. So it's quite interesting that we, we are not only referring to people that come from outside Britain, but we're also referring to people that come a long way or communicating a long way across Britain as well at this point. The other thing we have, again, is lots of evidence of brewing and people selling beer. This is, um, this is a docket, and there are four different, three different um, entries on this docket. So it's a receipt, basically, for different amounts of beer sold to different people. So Crispus, with crisps and beer, which is handy. Crispus, um, he only bought five denarii worth. Somebody else bought 105 units, which is seven denarii. And Januarius, um, he, he only bought a little bit of beer as well. Januarius is a name that crops up time and time again, and he was the only one that was on um, one of our inked writing tablets. So all the vast majority of the stylus tablets I showed you earlier. Um, but Januarius appears on, on an inked one as well. So we, we have some evidence of what people were actually doing in terms of earning money or working. And haulage and transporting goods is a theme that runs throughout. So not only on this one, we have one that dates to 61, 62 AD, which is just after the Boudican Revolt. Um, 
when they are paying someone to bring provisions into Londinium from St Albans. So we know that people are, St Albans has already recovered by that point and they're bringing goods in to rebuild London after the can fire of probably 61. Lots about um, business again, and um, you recognize the word forum obviously in here. This is the market, probably the market on Cornhill under the Bank of England now, possibly another market in elsewhere in the empire, we can't really be sure. But because it's, it's from London and because we've done statistical analysis on where, where our writing tablets um, are probably from, they're probably from the eastern, the eastern hill of the city of London, so it's likely that they were being used in the market in, on Cornhill as well. Um, this one is a, this is a, quite an entertaining one, really. Um, somebody's lent people money and they're boasting through the whole market. I ask you not to appear shabby, you will not thus favour your own affairs. And Roger Tomlin, who translated the cursive Latin into English for us, says that this is evidence of the city's first ill-judged loan. <laughs> but the vast majority of them, although we have hauliers and people selling beer, and those are, those are quite nice, as, um, small evocative um, examples of Roman Londoners, Generally, they all really relate to commerce and economy, and they entirely bear out what Tacitus said later on, of course, about how um, the hostile population of Londinium um, wasn't necessarily a Romanized culture. It wasn't a colonia, but it was, it was much more um, engaged in trading and commerce and um, transactions. But people have often... There's, there's been a, um, a sort of ongoing academic debate, really, as to the, the importance of the military in the early Roman city as well. And we have got lots of evidence of them being around. So we know, although we know that there's lots of business and money and, and economic might, really, within this early city, we also know that there are lots of military people here as well. And in particular, the cavalry. And the Curionis here, that's the key word in this one. Um, that relates to cavalry officers quite high ranking, um, they're all named, they've borrowed money. So these are two columns. So down here, we don't, we've lost this bit, but this presumably is the money that they were lent or were lending, borrowing. And down here is their names. And the names are written um, in their own handwriting. So lots of different people have signed this, um, this docket. And this example is a similar example. I'm whacking, sorry, I'm going through this quite quickly, but. Um, they're witnesses, again, to a legal document which we've lost most of, but this is a, a typical example of how you would sign a witness statement in, early, in, the, early Roman, in the early Roman London period, at least. Um, and they are all from various troops, and again, they've signed their own names, so there's different handwriting in each one. All these names um, are well attested from Rome itself, so the, the thinking about these chaps is that they are quite high-ranking cavalry officers, possibly even members of the Imperial Mounted Guard, um, and because they can all write their name and they're witnessing something that we don't know the details of, but was also a written, written document, um, they're all literate, so they're, they're high status chaps as well. Um, I mentioned about the names. This is only A to L. I couldn't go beyond because I run out of slide um, space, but they're all really fabulously Roman sounding. Um, and you'll see I've highlighted their relationships um, in purple. They're all fathers or sons or freedmen or slaves. And um, their sort of status, really, in, in red. So consuls are fairly obvious. The emperor's um, a pretty good one. He, wasn't, he didn't write the, ta the tablet. He was just mentioned on it. Um, but there's no women in any of them. And we'll come on to that in a second. But it is worth looking at a couple of these examples. Um, and I can't even pronounce these. Etignia Maris, how about that? Um, we know that this, this tablet relates to the fact that he came on the 25th of December, which is an auspicious date for us now, but obviously was meaningless in the Roman period. Although it was Mithras's birthday as well, but that's much later than this. Um, and he, again, his, is, um, is involved in money lending. And we know that this particular name is also well attested only in two parts of the Roman Empire, really four in modern Belgium and Mainz in in modern Germany. So we, we can trace through his name the, um, where, he, he or her, where he originated. Another example, much rarer example, are names with reduct in the beginning um, as a prefix. So reductus is our example. Oh, sorry. Reductus is our example. 
And this is really, really a rare name. There aren't many um, examples at all. Certainly none from, you'll see none from modern Europe. They're all from North Africa. Um, from Algeria, Tunisia, Lem Lembiensis, we'll all know, um, is a famous Roman town in Algeria. Um, and this chap presumably came from there to London. Now, when we talk about people coming into Roman London, they'd obviously not all of them came by choice. Um, and there's quite a dark aspect to a lot of the history of the Roman period. Human trafficking. This is a, um, not from Bloomberg, but it's another famous example which most of you will be familiar with. Fortunata was a slave girl who was sold in a market, probably in London, for 600 denarii, which is a lot of money. Two years' salary for a soldier at the time. Um, and I said before, there are no female names on any of our tablets. The only females we have on tablets are both slaves who were sold in the market. But um, the lack of female names uh, just reflects Roman society really at the time. I don't think we should get too offended about, about that in retrospect. Um, it's very complex and the, the roles that women contributed to Roman society were, weren't acknowledged even though they contributed a lot. Um, this is another tablet, not a great photo I'm afraid. This is actually found on the Walbrook um, in the 1950s on a, one of the rescue excavations then. And again, um, it relates to somebody um, getting the money's worth from this girl. And we know that Fortunata cost three, 600 denarii. And at the same time, we have other examples from Rome where a six-year-old girl was 130 denarii and a 19-year-old girl was 300 denarii. So 600 denarii is presumably somebody of um, a young adult age who was useful for various things, let's say. Uh, we do have other evidence of slavery in Roman London. There are a few finds, and somebody needs to synthesize this and publish this. Uh, this is a really interesting part of our, um, our city's history, really. We had one limb shackle, so probably lower limb. Um, it's only half, obviously, uh, but it would have probably had a chain leading from there over to this side. Um, this is from the Bloomberg excavation that we did most recently, found by Pat at the back, our metal detectorist. Um, this is found on the site directly north of Bloomberg, which is now the City of London Magistrates Court. It's a beautiful stone building, quite high, four or five storeys. And in the 1870s, um, John Price did an amazing rescue excavation, picked up lots of stuff, made some amazing notes, and found um, this manacle, which is much better condition than our one, actually. And there's another one, um, again, from Bucklesbury House in the 1950s, which, um, during Grimes and Noel Hume's work, this was published by Tony Wilmot in 1991. And again, it's very similar to our one, actually. And the likelihood is that because London was such a huge port in the Roman period, and lots of the goods for the rest of Britain came through London, um, there would have been uh, a huge number of slaves coming through as well. So although they're pretty invisible in the archaeological record, they would have been very visible on the streets of our town. So it looks like we need to add London to the sort of rather dark um, list of, of, of places in the Roman Empire that we know definitively have links with slavery. I'm going to try with the Latin again. Venalicius means for sale. Um, Mango is a dealer in slaves, specifically in slaves. And Venaliciarius is slave dealing. So these are three phrases that we have in epigraphy and um, historical texts from the Roman period. And now we have to add London to, to that list. But it's not all dark. There are some really positive, uh, nice things within the writing tablets. So I, I said that um, cursive Latin was really hard to read, but this is not that hard. Um, we can all see that that's an alphabet. And um, there's an alphabet on both sides of this tablet, actually. So people were practicing, they were being taught how to write. The huge number of writing tablets and styluses as well, particularly, um, indicate that literacy was actually really widespread in the Roman society. Although, I'm talking about Romans, people coming in to London, so they would probably have been people who were literate, traders, the army, that kind of thing. Um, although, and although this one is, is easy to read by my eyes, um, as someone with famously bad handwriting, they're not all that easy. This is just an example of all the different ways that people write the letters. So to translate um, these, that's, that's more like my handwriting style there. Um, <laughs> To translate these was a real challenge to Roger Tomlin at Oxford, and he, he still, it's still an ongoing process. We're having them photographed again from different angles to see if we can get more information out of them. So I started off by saying I wanted to prove a point. I hope I, I kind of have proved a point that um, 
London at the beginning was very much a Roman town. There's, there's, although there are Celtic names, they, they may have come from outside Britain. Um, we have finds that come from elsewhere in Britain later on in the Roman period, maybe um, after, the, after the Roman conquest, people come into London to work, economic migrants like myself, for example. Um, but at the beginning, it's very much a Roman town, and we know that the Romans came from all around the Roman Empire, so that was why I said what I said. Um, just to finish, there are a really fantastic assemblage of, um, of information about people, really, apart from being artefacts and nice things to find. The names and, and the details of what people were doing here is a magical bit about them, really. And I'm just really glad that they were not made constantly.